Hello, everyone. Good evening. Great to see everybody. Maureen, good to see you. We got Terry, Sonia, Dino. Who else is in here? Let's see, Anthony, Colin, Mary. Welcome all. Thank you. Uh, tonight we have a special guest. I'm going to be introducing him in a few minutes. But before I do, I'm going to get into the deck here and get this presentation set up for you all to see. And we'll run through a couple of quick housekeeping items. All right. So first and foremost, my name is Louis Ayano. Great to see everybody tonight. We have some other co-hosts that are a little tied up. So that's one of the advantages of working in a great team. You all know that real estate is a team sport. So I've been able to take over tonight and help out with presenting our guest. All right. So please make sure that you're doing your own diligence and research. Nothing we provide here is investment advice. If you want to take a snapshot of that quickly. Again, a couple of quick items to do and not to do. Definitely ask some questions. Um, we're going to have a great guest this evening. So if you have anything that you want to ask, you can definitely raise your hand or throw it in the chat there and we can bring it to attention. Uh, say hi to engage. Feel free to throw out any ideas there on what we're talking about and definitely be courteous and respectful to everyone on the call. And please do not solicit or sell anything. And again, this will be recorded and definitely available to everyone on the portal. All right. So without further ado, we're going to be getting into a bit of State of the Union and some mortgage news updates here and the latest. So I would like to introduce from Pico Mortgages, Dan Johannes. Dan, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing well, my friend. Thanks for the, uh, the introduction there, Lewis, and thanks for having me on tonight. Awesome. Thank you. Now, listen, Dan, what do you want people to know about you? I know you're a mortgage broker, but what else can you share to give people a, a good sense of where you're coming from and what you can help with? Yeah, great question. Um, so a little bit about me. I've been a mortgage broker for about seven years now. Started working for a few different uh, uh, firms that uh, that dealt with mortgages. Prior to that, I was at TD Securities, dealt with uh, credit default swaps, mortgage-backed securities, all that fun sort of stuff, and uh, eventually found my way into the world of brokering. From there, um, I did launch my own brokerage called Pico Mortgages. We're about uh, two years in, and uh, we sort of focus on the education aspect because there is a lot of stuff uh, to go through when it comes to financing properties, whether it's your owner occupied or you're getting into investment property, there's a lot to, to know. And uh, really that's for us to, to figure out and to communicate it with you folks. And part of, uh, yeah, part of what we do is service residential as well as commercial across Canada. And we've got an office uh, just outside of Ontario in Kitchener Waterloo, but uh, we're right across Canada. We've got an office as well in Canmore, be uh, beautiful Alberta. So um, we're, yeah, I, I find myself uh, going back and forth and, uh, we've got our team, uh, mostly here. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those things that, um, as I got into the industry, I realized that, uh, yeah, there was a lot I needed to know and there's a lot that, uh, you know, uh, I'm willing to share with everyone. So a little bit of accolades here, nothing too fancy, just, uh, been on some, uh, media, um, uh, you know, anywhere from real estate wealth. Uh, and so crew to CMP to CBC and a few other ones in there. Beautiful. I love that. And, uh, I'm very happy to know that you're doing a little bit of coaching and mentoring along the way mm -hmm. with the mortgage brokering. So ha helping people stick handle around their choices and, and opportunity with mortgage lending. Yeah, you got it. I mean, a lot of it is, is essentially kind of empowering people to make the right decisions right and it's not just a matter of the first especially people that are buying for the first time it's it's about kind of figuring out your plan for not only today but uh, down the road and, and how you may want to build a portfolio or a legacy so um yeah happy to do it i love it all right we're gonna get into it here 
Sure. Um, so a couple of main points here. Dan, if you want to comment to these, these are a few things that uh, we've put together at Rule, and uh, we'd love to hear your kind of two cents on it and sure. how you see things kind of shaping up. Well, yeah, Lewis, as you know, uh, this year's been, you know, a little different than previous years uh, when it comes to financing and uh, just real estate in general, you know, so a lot of things have happened. Uh, the first thing on here, rates have stabilized as bank uncertainty looms. So this is something that uh, I don't think a lot of people were able to predict um, the sort of uh, instability in the banks globally, and that's led to... Um, you know, uh, rates actually dropping a little bit sooner than what was predicted. So um, kind of getting into 2023, the sentiment was uh, we, were, we weren't going to see rates come down anytime soon. Um, but then that sort of changed as uh, as the word came out and we had some liquidity issues with a few of the banks and, you know, uh, the run on on a few of them. So right now, um, if we're looking at the bond market, and the bond yield is really what dictates where fixed rate mortgages are going. It's it's gone down a little bit. So as that um, as that bond yield goes down, we start to see fixed rates react to that. Uh, Bank of Canada made the announcement a few weeks ago, and um, you know they're uh, they're talking about inflation coming down. We're not where we need to be. Target inflation is around two percent. And uh, we're a little bit higher. I think we're at like four point one or something like that. So yeah. the next announcements in June. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's kind of split down the middle. I know there was an article today in Reuters that said that inflation might be a little bit more sticky, so we can maybe expect interest rates to stick around a little bit longer, higher. So maybe the end of Q4, we'll start to see it slide down. So, yeah, that's kind of what's going on with rates. Um, and this kind of segues into the next thing, Lewis, here with the average qualifying rate. So let's talk a little bit about this. For some uh, people that are on the call today, they may not know sort of how things are in today's market. And obviously we've had um, the B20 guidelines. Those are guidelines that kind of came into play to kind of help protect uh, borrowers from over leveraging themselves and uh, kind of getting into the situation that uh, the, the US kind of faced during the um, housing crisis. Right. So the mortgage qualifying rate has gone up. It's always been basically the standard mortgage qualifying or stress test rate uh, or your contract rate plus 2%. So prior to all of the rate increases, that was sitting at 5.25%. But now that all mortgages are essentially over 3.25, that means we've got to go to your contract rate plus 2%. So right here where we say that investor mortgages, the qualifying rate's about 75 to 8%. That's not the rate that an investor would get on a mortgage, unless we're talking maybe an alternative or you've got bruised credit or something else like that. But generally 75 and 8%, is what we're using to stress test someone today if they were to get a mortgage. That means their their interest rate would be about uh, anywhere from you know five and a half to six percent. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And a uh, quick comment regarding the B twenty rules. Yeah. How have you seen that kind of affect eligibility? I know you know the average qualifying is one thing, but uh, all other things considered, has it really stifled beginners getting into the market? Or there are ways around it. Mm, yeah, so there's it's definitely kind of um, a reduced buying power for a lot of people, yeah. um, simply because that sort of um, you know that benchmark or that bar has gone up a little bit, and um, you know they're very strict for insurers. If you've got an insured mortgage, and this could actually go for someone that's looking for an owner occupied plus rental, right? So maybe someone wants to get into buying their first property, they don't have the full twenty percent down. Uh, but they can still get an insured mortgage, but they have to be owner occupied, occupied plus a rental suite in it. So this this could actually apply to someone there, but um, it still would affect your overall affordability and, and your buying power um, due to the the sort of B twenty guidelines. And I know there's uh, talks for OSFI, that's the uh, Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions. That's a mouthful, but they're considering uh, kind of tightening up. Um, you know, the lending criteria on the horizon. So there's talks of that. We've got a few um, you know, consumer agencies and uh, and um, sort of uh, like the Mortgage Professionals Canada and a few other ones are lobbying against the government to say, hey, look, you know, it's unaffordable that is, as it is. Do we really need to start increasing or tightening the lending criteria? So that's kind of on the on the table right now. Possible that it could happen, but nothing's changed as of right now. 
Yeah, I, I tend to think that the rates are gonna stay relatively consistent from where they are now for, I feel into 2024. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we're gonna yeah. see any softening. And I think things are a little too frothy for them to start increasing rates even more. You know? Yeah, there's a lot of, like I said, uncertainty. Um, you know, we are seeing the intended of, in, uh, effect of um, of uh, interest rates going, or sorry, inflation starting to come down to the target. Um, now, you know, we'll, we'll see in the next couple of months what happens, but I think the, the market is predicting that, uh, yeah, we're not going to see a reduction um, this year, likely Q4. We'll start to see that uh, that shift down. So, yeah, a little bit more of the roller coaster for anyone that's in a variable rate mortgage. They've got to stick it out a little bit longer. Well, that's it. I mean, mortgage is one thing, but I'm thinking about, you know, uh, loans and other instruments folks you are using it. and carrying mm -hmm. debt at rates of, you know, excess of a typical mortgage rate that yeah. could be, you know, seven to eight, nine to 11 percent. I've seen mm -hmm. it's not uncommon these days because of the way things have gone in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. So it's interest is not cheap to carry these days. You got it. Yeah. Any type of, and, and exactly with uh, home equity lines of credit, you know, a lot of people that had gotten it maybe 18, 24 months ago, they were looking at incredibly low interest rates. It was kind of hard to say no when uh, one, the qualifying criteria was, was a lot lower and uh, the cost of borrowing was so low. Right. But as it started to creep up, if someone had a balance on it or they used that uh, against the house for, for maybe leveraging to purchase another property, um, you, you had to make sure that you were doing it smart and uh, yes. sort of buffering in for, for those increases, for sure. A hundred percent. Yeah. All right. And here's a chart. Do you want to, do you want to speak yeah. to this for a minute? Of our sure. Five yeah. Years? You know, it's interesting because um, I started looking at some of the historical data and this is one of the questions that comes up all the time, right? Like, oh my God, interest rates are through, through the roof. So it doesn't matter if, if, if prices have gone down, I can't afford it. Well, what can you really afford? If we look at this, the last few years during COVID was the anomaly. It wasn't sort of the, the standard or the norm. And if we go back to 2006, 2007, 2008, we were hitting around 6% as an average. Right now it's four point. I think it was 4.69, something like that. Um, and these are all sort of average between insured and uninsured mortgages. But you can see, we're not at, we're not at the peak. We're nowhere near it. Uh, no. In fact, if we go back over 30 years, the average was over 5%. I believe it was 5.14 uh, in Canada for a mortgage. Yeah. And, and you know, we have to remember that the rates are one thing, but the mm -hmm. value, the principal amount that's being applied, I mean, that's really going to dictate what, what the end result is between your principal and interest that you're paying on a monthly basis. You got it. Yeah. Once those properties have increased in value over the last 20 years, you know, a 4.5 or a 6.5 is going to look a lot different when the mortgage is an extra half a million dollars, give or take. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. So it's something to keep in mind is just perspective. And that's what I tell a lot of people, right? Cause they, they, they may Absolutely. look at their, their existing mortgage and uh, we'll have people come to us and say, Hey, look, we're considering refinancing, taking equity out, maybe buying an investment property. And, but our rate was, you know, 2%, but let's take a look at it and, and say, okay, well, by breaking the mortgage or redoing it and accessing the equity one, you're getting into a market where we're seeing consistently across the board, uh, housing prices are a lot more affordable than they were before. Right. So, and there's not as many bidding wars, depending on what market you're in, we're not seeing that type of uh, action on it. So people can actually negotiate their, uh, their offers these days. So, you know, it's, um, it is what it is, but I don't think it's a cause of cause for concern. Right. And you know what, I, don't mean to put you on the spot, but I want to ask you a question uh, here uh, for beginners and for seasoned investors. Sure. What would be the perfect deal for an underwriter to push through for mm -hmm. a, be a beginner? You know, what would that kind of look like? A couple of, of main points that they would want to see. And same for a seasoned investor. If, if someone's picking up a property and there has to be a couple of metrics in place, what right. would the, the best kind of deal look like for underwriters to uh, push through these days? Well, that's a great question, Lewis. And I think, uh, you know, all of us that are in the industry as uh, agents or brokers, we either have done underwriting or we're actively underwriting and looking to uh, to place files. So I guess, yeah, it would be very similar to someone working at a bank. What is the ideal sort of client that's coming to them or to us? Um, there's a few things. You want to make sure that 
your credit is in good standing. There's no skeletons in the closet. No, and if there is, let's address it because uh, you know, for for most uh, things, there's there's definitely a way to to work around it. Um, so that's that's important is uh, taking care of anything like that. Um, I would say proper notes. So notes are very important. It's all about the story. So a lot of people talk about the four C's: credit, collateral, capacity, etc. There's one more C that people don't talk about, and that's character. So understanding the person that's actually borrowing the the money is also important. And uh, the more we know about the story, the more we can sell that story to the lender, right? So um, that's also important. Uh, I would say if you haven't filed your taxes, it's always a great idea to get those done and get those up to date because you know that could be the difference between going to a lender that maybe uh, is going to have a higher interest rate versus one that uh, if you're up to date on your taxes, we can get you a better interest rate on it. So a few things there. Gotcha. And is there, from what you've seen over the last year or two, is there a particular type of product that mm -hmm. investors are buying that is showing more resilience in the marketplace than others? You know, say, for example, like a multifamily home versus an eightplex, you know, mm -hmm. the multifamily is going to be uh, maintaining that value, if not increasing over the last two years, because rents have gone up and it's going to have a better cash flow. Therefore, it's going to show better on, you know, a financial analysis sheet versus that single family home. So any products that kind of stand out to you that investors should be paying attention to that uh, underwriters want on mm -hmm. their desk? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So, sorry you you had you had referred to multifamily, and then you compared it to eightplex. Was just did you mean like single family versus multifamily or something? Yeah, as an example. Yeah, yeah like any type yeah. of real estate product out there that's mm. kind of showing more resilience. I I mentioned multifamily because I believe that to be true. But yeah. any other you know any other mm. products that you see out there, type of real estate that um, is still performing well considering the the rates have gone up. Yeah. Uh, so we do commercial as well here too. We've got a few on our, our desk that I've been looking at um, and we're just waiting for a certificate of insurance from, from CMHC. And uh, one of the gentlemen that, uh, that we're working with, you know, he's, uh, he's been able to amass a pretty good um, portfolio based on multifamily. Part of this is uh, limiting your, your sort of risk exposure. And I think anytime you've got more than one unit uh, exposed, that's good because you don't have 100% vacancy. I've, I've seen some people that, uh, you know, they'll purchase a condo and then either there's a special assessment or maintenance fees go through the roof or something yeah. like that. And, and that's something to keep in mind because if you're looking to, to build a portfolio and let's say we're doing it on the residential side, but you're continuously buying uh, condominiums or any, any property that has maintenance fees on it, that is an additional fee that we also have to carry. Yes. So some of these older buildings might have, you know, very high maintenance fees, but uh, low cost of of acquisition that might not be the best bet so what i like to do too is just kind of create a framework and strategy before you even put pen to paper and put an offer in right it's just a matter of figuring out what's what's optimal and where do you where do you want to go 100 percent, excellent yeah. all right ah okay so this one here, uh, th and I I'm glad you guys included this slide. Uh, this is from one of the monoline lenders. Monoline lender is a lender that works in the broker channel. They kind of specifically deal with just mortgages. They're not selling you anything else. And they had put together one of these uh, these comparative decks. And you can see basically it, it goes right to January of this year. And uh, if you look at the fixed versus variable rate mortgages and where we're at, yeah. um, we're nowhere clear, uh, close to the late nineties or, um, you know, the early two thousands where rates were at on the fixed side. And I just kind of threw this one in here for uh, comparison purposes too. And this kind of speaks on where interest rates are today. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. All right. And so getting into the investor mindset, what, what are some ways that people can kind of go about accessing capital? um strategies that can help them negate some of these interest rates that are going up yeah um so there's a few ways you could access capital obviously if you've got an existing property it's always a good idea to leverage up um use the bank's money to do it right so if you can afford to uh, maybe unlock a home equity line of credit uh and that way the nice thing is if you do a home equity line of credit and you have it sitting there you can deploy those funds fairly quickly. Um, not only that, you're not paying 
right? So if you do a, a, an equity takeout, if you know that, okay, I'm in the market for a property, we've run through sort of the, um, uh, the application and we've come up with a strategy that makes sense. And okay, if we do an equity takeout, we know that you're going to deploy these funds immediately. You're going to buy property. You may have to sit on it for a few months or whatever it is until you find that property. If someone is just kind of considering it and saying, hey, you know what, let me open up my capacity and see if something comes on the market, but uh, I'm just casually uh, looking, I would say a home equity line of credit is a good idea to unlock because one, you don't have any carrying costs. So once you have it active, unless you draw on it, you're, you're only paying on what you draw on. Uh, the nice thing with the home equity line of credit too is if you don't use all, all of it, but you still have uh, some available um capital there, then if you do buy a property that needs to to have a little bit of uh you know elbow grease put in and, and some renos done, you can do it by drawing on the uh the line of credit. So that's an option. And then obviously refinancing an existing property. You can get a few people on uh too. I've seen this where you add co-applicants to help qualify you or down payment. And I know Naran speaks uh quite a bit about joint venture agreements as well too that yes. you know we've seen. So JVs could be a good opportunity there. Excellent. I, you mentioned it earlier in the call. Um, for first-time home buyers or mm -hmm. you know uh, investors that are just getting their feet wet in the market, purchasing a home that has a secondary suite as a, a rental income, I'm getting mixed reactions sometimes from mm -hmm. from banks whether they like that type of product or not for first-time investor, investors because they haven't necessarily had the experience of uh, being a landlord before or managing a property that they not only live in as a primary residence, uh, but also have a tenant in. So mm -hmm. can, can you speak to that a little bit from your experience? Is that uh, you know a good opportunity for beginner investors to get into where they're, uh, they have their primary residence, but then also a source of income from it? Yeah, it's something that we've started to see a little bit more of over the last year or so, because as sort of the, the stress test started to creep up and people checked back in and said, hey, you know, I'm trying to get in the market and realize their, buy their buying power had gone down. We started looking at the other strategy of maybe looking at a property that has a separate entrance and uh, a suite. So lenders will, and, and again, this gets back to the other C, so character and being able to create the story and and sell it really to the bank and on how, uh, you know, a first time home buyer would be able to manage a tenant as well too. Typically, if it's we can order what's called a market rent report. So that's a report that's basically just added on to the appraisal. And it's an appraiser's assessment uh, of, of sort of um, market rents and what you could get on the open market for it. Banks can then use that to help offset the carrying costs. And it, it helps to bump up the affordability a little bit. I like doing that. If someone's unsure, if they're maybe on the fence and ah, that might be good as a mortgage helper or you know, just having a little bit extra space, if you're considering it, it's a good option because it opens up another door and being able to, you know, uh, help generate some income and then get your, your feet wet. If, uh, if you're considering doing this, uh, on a larger scale. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this little, th there was a little, uh, a uh, stat there I saw come up yesterday yeah. and it was one because I'm in Kitchener Waterloo and this kind of surprised me that one fifth of all residential properties are investment properties. So, you know, I don't know if Naran has a, uh, <laughs> has a hand in, in, in that stat there, but, uh, I know he does a lot of investments in KW. So, you know, uh, Dan, your opinion, do you, mm. do you think that is an accurate stat? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know what they're taking into consideration. What data? Um, that's, that's true too. One fifth seems to be a little high, but mm. yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It's mainstream. Yeah. Throw your hands up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got it. All right. Um, all right. So if folks are having difficulty in the qualifying stage, can you speak to a couple of these things? I know we already kind of looked at um, or discussed a few, but just to kind of recap what folks can look at to to make sure they can push sure. an application through. Yeah. And this is great. This is um, these are uh, alternative ways of finding lenders to uh, um, to provide the financing. So speaking on a residential side. A lot of credit unions also offer non-B20 compliant mortgages. So these are mortgages that are stress testing you based off of the actual rate you get. So the nice thing there is instead of say qualifying you on the previous slide, it was like seven and a half to 8%. Let's say they, uh, the credit union is offering a, a 
non-stress test mortgage, the rate's going to be a little bit higher. They always, uh, you know, price in uh, an adjustment for that. But let's say it's an extra 50 basis points higher, but all of a sudden it unlocks maybe, I don't know, 50,000, possibly more of purchasing power. This is an option you can look at by getting a uh, non-B20. And it's because uh, the credit unions are provincially regulated as opposed to uh, federally, federally regulated that they're able to do this. So that was a good idea to... Um, um, you know, to, to look at those options with uh, with credit unions. Keep in mind, though, credit unions, depending on what credit union you go to, like some of the larger ones like Meridian, they can pretty much service, you know, anywhere. But some of the smaller ones are very boutique niche uh, for a specific region. So, you know, if you're looking to buy maybe in another town or community that you're not really familiar with what options are out there, it's always a good idea to just kind of reach out to a broker and see what uh, if they have access to that market. So that's one option. Uh, the other option is, well, they used to be called B lenders. They don't like being called B lenders for some reason. So alt A lenders, lenders that uh, they use, um, you know, the, the rates are a little bit higher. That's uh, that's a con. Another con would be a lender fee that they do charge, but there's a lot of pros to it, right? If it's between not getting into a property and getting into a property, and we all know that the best time to invest in real estate was 20 years ago. Uh, yeah. And if you can't, you know, if you hadn't done that, um, if you want to get into real estate today, this is a great option. We see a lot of investors take advantage of this because one, they have higher rental offsets. So they do a rental offset as opposed to a rental ad back. Basically, a lot of the bigger banks, they're doing ad backs. And because even if you get um, a really good renter and they're paying great um, rent to you, you can't. We can't use it for a qualifying um, criteria. We can't use 100% of it. So a lot of lenders will use anywhere from 50 to 80, sometimes a little bit more. But there is a big difference between banks and their guidelines on this. So the Alt A lenders are a little bit more uh, generous with being able to do this, which means that you know your debt ratios go a lot further, and you can add more units or or more property to that portfolio. The other thing is maximum doors. So some of them offer a higher um, higher limit on the amount of doors you can have in your portfolio, and then other things like hold goes. So a lot of good things there. And then uh, BFS that stands for business for self or self employed individuals. So anyone that's in sort of that. Um, commission-based world or uh, self-employed. We deal with a lot of entrepreneurial people here. Mm -hmm. Those types of uh, borrowers, if you go to one of your you know, local banks, you may have been turned away, but uh, there are a lot of programs that are available out there for specifically designed for um, self-employed individuals. And this is great because we all know that as self-employed individuals, we have a tendency to not declare all of our income or use you know, creative ways with our accountant to write off a lot of that income. So if we're doing that, obviously we go to a bank and a lot of banks can only look at your line 15,000 or they'll gross it up a small amount where some of these alternative lenders are able to do a much higher um, income depending on what we can show the, the, the lender. So right. there's a few things there we can look at. All right, a quick comment regarding yes. the, um... oh, uh, like Meridian and uh, the Dukas. Right. Uh, have you seen a, a, an uptick in in applications with them just because of the rates going up and people looking for alternatives? I know you mentioned that some of them are more in a smaller markets or pay particular attention to their geographical locations. But what um, what's your sentiment on um, on credit unions? Yeah, I love them. I mean, credit unions are great, especially if we get into construction financing. Credit unions are are pretty darn good for that. But um, they, you know, because they're community driven, a lot of them, you're not going to have a huge central underwriting hub. You're not going to have, you know, if if you're familiar or if you're, I guess, used to dealing with um, maybe a really great a mortgage portal for doing all of your banking or whatever. Some of the the local credit unions aren't going to have that. Like we deal with a few of them out in Alberta um, and they're fantastic. We just need a little bit more time, a little bit more of a runway in order to get all those documentation. Some of them require you to go into the branch to kind of finish up the signing on things a little old school that way. But at yeah. the same time, you know, you do have someone at the branch or or, or someone to talk to directly if anything uh, were to come up. So a lot of the credit unions I do quite enjoy working with. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, they're they're pretty fantastic. And they, their risk appetite has been fairly good. Some of them will top out. Like they'll say, hey, look, you know, uh, borrower A, we can't have more than a million or 1.5 million uh, total uh, risk exposure with us at this credit union. We don't care if you go to another one, but uh, you can't do it here. So yeah, there's some limitations there. Gotcha. And just curious with credit unions and uh, business for self, Hmm. Do they do they have a, a good relationship with they self-employed? Do. They do. Some of them do. So some will have like stated income programs. So you basically provide bank statements, declaration of income, and they work with that. Um, a lot of them sort of white label. So they'll wrap it up. And in the broker channel, they, they don't want to sort of advertise that they're working in the broker channel, but they'll wrap it up and they'll say, hey, you know, of course, we'll take care of your self-employed individuals. And, uh, you know, it just it's under a white label, whatever it could be. But um, yeah, they definitely have a, an appetite and, and uh, yeah, with, with self-employed. All right. Excellent. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Dan, are you opposed to taking a question or two from- No, go for it. That's why I'm here. I don't normally sit around at my office at uh, eight o'clock at night unless I've got some amazing people to hang out with and uh, I see you guys all there. So sure. <laughs> Okay, let's see. I'm just going to go through the uh, the chat quickly here and see if I can find any questions. If sure. anyone has a question and would like to raise their hand, please do so now and we can get to you while I'm kind of sifting through these questions here. Uh, okay, no one yet. So Maureen has a question. When it comes to credit rating, how many years back are the uh, Equifax authorized to record? Um, sorry, well, how many years back? Uh, yeah. Oh, I see it here. When it comes to credit rating, how many years back? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, if you've got, it depends on on what it is. So uh, it reports, most, most uh, trade lines will report on a monthly basis. If you've got something like a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy or, um, you know, something with FRO, family resource uh, office, then those will show up and even... If it's not on Equifax, sometimes they'll find it on TransUnion. So keep that in mind. Right. A lot of banks, if um, if they suspect something might be on there, or you know, there's let's say for example, someone uh, has only had reestablished credit for a couple of years and nothing's reporting prior to that, they may go and dig a little bit deeper. But um, yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen trade lines reporting over 10, 12 years. But really what matters is probably the last uh, 24 to 36 months of reporting. Uh, if you can clean things up, like I did my advanced Equifax certification training and uh, part of the the um, training was uh, I ended up tanking my own credit score for fun. Don't ever do this, guys. But, wow. uh, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a boring Wednesday. So what I ended up doing is typically my credit, my FICO score sits around 780 or so. And I ended up um, saying, okay, well, I haven't missed any payments. I don't intend on missing payments, but let's uh, increase um, our utilization on it. So I basically with, it was kind of dumb, but it was also kind of fun at the same time. So I ended up um, just maxing everything, right? So I maxed my my line of credit, my three credit cards, pulled it all out, pulled my bureau again. And, you know, we're, we're authorized by Equifax to do hard pulls. Obviously we've got a mortgage brokerage here. So I checked my score again and sure enough, I, I, I dropped to the high fives. Uh, and uh, I was like, wow, well, okay, yeah, that's not a good thing. But um, uh, very quickly, I was able to just apply the funds back, uh, pay down my util- or pay down the um, the cards. So my utilization was below fifty percent. And uh, all of this, I think I did about twelve pulls uh, total, uh, hard pulls within uh, a week. So wow. it was actually eight days from the time I pulled it the first time to the last time I pulled it. And it, it went like this, like basically 780 down to the high fives. And then by the, the eighth day, I got it back up to about 760, whatever. And it was fine. Like it was okay. So a lot of this, um, there's a lot of misconception on credit scores and people get really afraid of uh, having a hard pull done. Yes. But, you know, it's it's not the same. Like if you went in and you got a fair stone or a payday loan or cash money, and you're applying for credit cards, that weighting is definitely different on your bureau and that would have an effect. But typically what happens is if you're if you're shopping for a mortgage, you're working at a bank or a brokerage and they pull a bureau, uh, you got 30 days. So you can go around and shop or we'll do the shopping and it's not really going to affect your score. And to be honest, the difference between 
you know, having a 720 and 820 is nothing. It's not going to affect your rate. You don't get a better rate. Um, you know, you might get a trophy from your significant other, but other than that, nothing. So yeah, it's, it's not as big as people think. The, the number one thing though, is just make sure you stay up on your payments and uh, don't miss anything. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, and a question from Anthony, what's the minimum equity you need to have in a property for an equity takeout? Mm. Well, yeah, this is a great question. So typically, so banks will, if we're not talking about private lending, we're just talking, you know, your, uh, your banks and your credit unions, the maximum loan to value is 80%. And it's not 80% of the, um, I guess, purchase price or a value as per, you know, let's say MLS or something. It's the appraiser's opinion. Right. So the bank will look at it and let's say you got a house that's, um, worth a million dollars, uh, according to an appraiser, then the maximum is 80%. So that's basically it. Um, if you're actually talking about a dollar amount for a minimum equity takeout, that's a good question. I know most lenders will not lend, like if you've got a mortgage and it's up for renewal, if it's under 50,000, good luck finding a lender that's going to take it on because yeah. you know there's a lot of costs associated with uh, transferring the mortgage over. So there isn't really a lot there for them to take care of. So um, I see the same thing with uh, lines of credit. So if you get, and I think it's Scotiabank, if you can do over 50,000 a line of credit, then we can go for an exception to get you a lower interest rate, but um, on that line of credit. But I don't know, that's a good question. I mean, you obviously want to weigh it too, right? Because if you're doing an equity takeout, one, you got to consider, am I breaking a mortgage? If I'm breaking a mortgage, what are those penalties involved with it? Yep. Two, if I'm refinancing, I've got legal fees. So what are those legal fees going to cost? And um, yeah, the amount of work to go into it. But um, yeah. feel free to reach out to me. I mean, I can take a look. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. No, no problem. And Terry has a question. In helping for the qualification of a commercial mortgage, what percentage of the net operating income on a commercial property counts towards the income qualification. Okay, um, this is a good one, Terry. With the the hard questions here, Terry. Oh, and then it looks like you're uh, you've got a, a borealis behind you too, <laughs> man. You're living it up. Uh, <laughs> uh, you got another one below. So that's I mean that's a good question. I'm um, what percentage of the net operating income? So if we're talking about a CMHC insured mortgage, typically what they're doing is like, obviously they take a look at your rent roll and they'll take a look at your expenses and they determine what your DCR is. And then they, they do it uh, based off of that. Every bank has a different threshold as far as how they calculate that. And to be honest, when we're doing, um, when we're shopping for a letter of interest from a lender, the first thing they say to us is, look, get us the rent roll, get us the expenses. We want two years of financials. And then we'll talk to you, right? And oftentimes when we kind of take a look at the numbers and we go to a lender and we shop it around, it's it's significantly different. Um, so I don't think that helps you in answering your, your question, but feel free to reach out to me. I can probably put you in touch with one of our commercial guys that, that could answer it for you, Terry. I see another one below that though. You're well, talking about an RV. Even better, Terry, okay. you're, you're fully loaded today. So he's talking regarding contamination on a commercial property. Um, you know, seeking finance with uh, known contamination is, you know, Terry, is there um, ESA 1, ESA 2 complete? And is there a contractor working on it with you that is able to identify the cost of remediation? And Annalise, are, are you, sorry, Dan, Terry, no. do you want to add, do you want to bring in a little more context to this just so we can have Dan um, give it a good shot here? Annalisa, do you mind? Unmuting Terry quickly, please, but not for too long. <laughs> Maybe I can do it. So, yeah, this is uh, while while you're trying to figure that out there, Lewis. Uh, I don't get many RV parks here in Kitchener Waterloo, um, Terry, but I do see some where there's contamination, and obviously, if it's identified on the phase one then they would uh, condition to have a phase two done. Um, yeah. And it depends on what, uh, I guess, firm is doing the environmental. Because to be honest, like we just did one 
where the firm had, and this is out in Peterborough, and they recommended, look, we got to do a phase two. There's contamination, soil contaminants. Um, and uh, and then we went to get another phase one, and they said, what are they talking about? There's no environmental concerns here too. So yeah. it really depends. And, and also it was a different lender we approached the second time around. They said, you know, this isn't of concern. So a lot of it has to do with, you know, um, the, the story. And uh, I guess, I mean, 100 years ago, and remediation is $8 million to replace the soil. That's unbelievable. I mean, I, I would imagine that puts that in the unprofitable RV park. Well, uh, no, no, it's actually quite profitable. He, he's had it for 30 years and hasn't even been concerned with it until he decided to develop the property. Mm. That's when he discovered this. The bank said, no, it's, it's, it's uh, the environmental won't pass. So he came, came to me and said, do I want to buy it? And I said, well, I, I love the price is right. The income is great. I love the location. But what's my exit strategy? Right. If I can't refinance. I don't have any way to uh, to give sense of confidence to my investors. So I just said no. But I so I thought, you know, is, is that universally going to be the answer of every bank? Or you're, you're saying possibly not? Where's the... Uh, Thank where's you. The for, I'll, I'll re-mute re myself. Thanks. I was gonna say, where's the uh, where's the park located there, Terry? But um, is yeah, wh wh where is it at? Just type it in the chat. Yeah, you Terry, can type you it, type it in the Did chat. But I mean, yeah, that's a that's a tough one. I think in this sort of situation, you would definitely want to uh, get involved, especially credit unions. Credit credit unions could could probably pull something off, depending on the investors and and uh, you know if you can mitigate the risk on this. Um, it just seems that, uh, I don't know, there's got to be a solution here. But you're right. You don't want to get into a property unless you have a, a, a solid exit strategy for your investors, because that could be, a, you know, that could be one that you're holding on to for a long time. East coast yeah. of Vancouver Island. Oh, wow. That's Great. a beautiful area, too. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've got some guys that work out there i could probably put you in touch and and see if you could uh you can get some answers on that but definitely you want to you want to reach out and see if um if some even have a conversation with a few of the the firms out there to see if uh if they've you know come across anything like that because maybe some one of the local engineering firms may have had done some work or environmentals and come across something like this and then just say, Hey, who, who did you direct your, uh, your phase one, or your phase two, two, like what lender was it sent to? And then just follow up with the lender and say, okay, well, you know, you, you worked on this land. How did you guys figure it out? Cause I'm considering a similar property here. You just yeah. kind of have to go back. And, and Terry, if it was a mill, uh, I'm assuming it may have taken over more, more land, geographically than just the property in consideration for you so maybe speaking to the neighbors and finding out um if and when they've had a disposition or when they've been purchased or sold and how they've kind of dealt with it yeah that's a great idea uh all right maureen you had your hand up at one point do you have a question or you're okay all right she's excellent good. all right no more questions Dan, I think we got through. I think I answered everything for stage. everyone. That's amazing. Hey, I have one last question for you. Sure. Yeah, what's that? Construction financing these days for, mm. you know, uh, say an infill site, a new home someone's building, or a, a simple renovation that's maybe going to cost 150, 200K. What is the construction loan environment like these days? Um, is everyone playing ball with construction loans? And what's kind of the the, you know, general range of uh, construction financing yeah some it, it really depends it varies lender by lender and then obviously geographic location so some of them will do you know 65 or 80 percent of the um assessed or as complete value um i had one before where a uh, contractor um the prior contractor on um on site ended up using one of the draws to buy appliances and then they ran they couldn't uh, they couldn't finish it so they had to go back and figure out how are we uh, are we going to finish this because they weren't supposed to use the draw for obviously buying appliances um right. they were supposed to use it for other things so there there's certain things you want to be um considerate of some lenders like i know if you're doing construction financing you're going to have a lot more flexibility in the private or the mortgage investment corp world because um you know, they're a little bit more flexible on hitting certain milestones. So the quicker you can get in, the quicker you can do your renos and the quicker you can get out is probably a good idea. Um, yes. You guys are 
way more uh, involved with the construction side and, and the actual contractors and and you know you you guys have boots on the ground on how is it right now like is it hard to find people to do work um because i know from even my brother's doing a build and it's very difficult to find the contractors and keep them on site when um when you're a little bit behind right because they're like hey we've got to go we've got somewhere else we got to go I mean, it's it's a never-ending battle, uh, get, mm -hmm. getting them there, having them show up on time, having the material procured so they can uh, perform their work. It's um, it's a tough environment. And I don't think it's, you know, relegated to just the Toronto or the greater uh, the GTA area. I think it's it's in a lot of places, even mm -hmm. outside, outside of our borders, that uh, the, the COVID just seemed to really... Uh, either push people into retirement, not only the construction sector, but specifically what we're talking about, push push people out of the construction game because they were close to their retirement and just had, you know, had enough. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that really uh, tightened things up because we're already short on labor as it is. So it's right. just made, made the uh, bad situation that much worse, right? Yeah, no, I agree. There was, uh, I was just, a couple months ago touring a master plan community out in Calgary with one of the developers. And that was their biggest thing. It's like, can't keep people on site to finish it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something we're definitely dealing with. I see a few more questions in here, Lewis, if you wanted yes. to, we can go for that. Yeah. Maureen typed in there. I think that was the most recent one on a readvanceable mortgage that was just applied for, it, uh, Maureen, you were told it's uh, 9%. So on a HELOC. Oh, my career, a readvanceable mortgage. Like a uh, line of credit? A yeah, like a line. And Lisa, if you're able to unmute Maureen so she can give some more context. And there's one from Havana as well. Mute. There we okay. Go. <laughs> so you have your readvanceable and you have your conventional. So the conventional mortgage is your normal fixed rate, whatever variable. You got um, it. Right, but the readvanceable is it, it, uh, it's uh, set up automatically with a um, something like a Smith, a Smith maneuver. It's not the real 100% uh, of Smith maneuver, but something like that. So that you get, um, as soon as I start making my money, paying my money down, I start getting uh, cash available to me. So uh, I'm so just in the midst. I'm just in the midst of doing all this, and I was approved for the conventional. And I said, "Well, what about in this particular yeah. bank's name? It's called ReadyLine." Um, mm. And it was. Uh, he told me I have to be able to uh, qualify at nine percent, which, yay, I did. But <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Um, yeah, because right now, so a readvanceable, it would probably be in the ballpark of either Prime Plus um, half a point or a full point. So if we're looking at a full point at 6.7 plus 1%, that's 7.7. .7. You add two on that, you're at 9.7. Um, if it's half a point, then it's 9.2. So that would make sense for that was mm -hmm. your qualifying rate on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what's your actual rate? Is, or did they, is that for the, for, the, for the conventional mortgage? Like, I, I, sorry, Dan, I was approved for the conventional. And I said, what about the ready line? And they mm -hmm. went, oh, it's different. And I haven't had a chance to get back to them to find out exactly what that mortgage, that rate is going to be. Right. Um, but I was told today quickly when I was trying to do three things at the bank at the same time, <laughs> I think she said prime plus one Okay. or prime yeah. in around, in around there anyway, but I got the conventional at 5.05. .05. Okay. That's good. Conventional at 5.05 .05 in today's market. Not bad. Um, what I would do, Maureen, is I would push back on how, how, if you don't mind me asking, how big is the uh, line of credit port or the readvanceable portion that you're considering? Uh, from my understanding, it's the full amount. Okay. So that as I, as I put it, you know, put one up. Right. Yeah. So there's like a global down. limit. So Scotia has the total equity plan where basically there's two ways to uh, structure it. One is where it doesn't increase as you pay down your mortgage. It basically say, <laughs> stays. So let's say you had a, a million dollars uh, and 700 or sorry, 600,000 is your mortgage and 400,000 is your line of credit. You can do two ways. And I think the ready line is similar where the first way to do it is basically they're two separate. So you pay down your mortgage, but you still have 400,000. That doesn't change. 
Right. The other way to do it is as you pay down your mortgage, it's opening up more of your line of credit, which is readvanceable at that point, um, which I think this is what's happening in this case. Mm-hmm. I would go back to them, though, and just say, hey, look, um, a competing bank or I was talking to a broker and he offered uh, half a point over, so 0.5% over prime. Let okay. them play that game with them. Good cop, bad oh, cop. I do. Yeah, I do. And, and, and you'll be surprised because they have discretionary funds too, and they're able to do some things at the branch. You just gotta got you gotta ask for it. Right. Okay. No, that's yeah. great. That's great. Mm-hmm. So, no, I was. Um, yeah, it's BMO is good to us because it's the the bank of the defense community, so they automatically give us uh, percentages nice. off to start with. So, yeah, that's why yeah. I hit them up. So. All right. Great. No, thank you. Very, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And no the reason, and just two seconds before I get muted, the reason I asked about the how far back the, the like the credit bureau ping people can go, because when I was applying for this mortgage, they asked me about somebody who was on my credit rating that I divorced forty years ago. <laughs> you know, you'd be surprised. Years that's, ago. That's why I say like uh, skeletons in the closet. There's some things that you're like, wow. You know, when I was in. A university and I walked by that booth and I just said, sure, I'll apply for that card. And I completely forgot about it, but it was 25 years ago. Yeah. That'll yeah. come back to bite you. So, yeah. wow. So. Reunion 40 years ago. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so there we go. Needless to say, I have no financial commitments to that individual. Nor yeah. Do yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, <laughs> All right. That's funny. Sorry guys, but I have to run. It's been Thanks, great. Marie. Thank you for all the information, Dan. No problem. Thank you. Bye. Right. Hey, Dan, we're on the final stretch here. Havan has a question. Uh, Stress test for primary residents. Mm. What's that rate look like these days for stress test? Yeah, it's a good question. So stress test is 2% over your contract rate. Keep in mind, there are different types of mortgages. So you get different buckets. Um, One bucket would be your uninsured mortgage. So that's a conventional mortgage. You're putting uh, 20% down. Now, if you if you're putting more than twenty percent down, let's say you're you're putting like uh, 30, 35 percent, we can get you an insurable mortgage. That's a diff. That's number two. And then if you're putting less than twenty percent down, so you got to get CMHC involved. That's an insured mortgage. Three different types of mortgage products for owner occupied. Three different types of rates. If we're talking about a, uh, and sorry, what was uh, what, did did he indicate whether or not? It's a refi, and also if it's a refinance, so refinance is going to have a different rate. If we want to talk to the absolute lowest right now, purchase less than twenty percent down, you're probably looking at an interest rate of around four point, let's say four point six percent. So your stress test two two percentage points over that six point six percent. Right. Gotcha. We've seen there's some outliers, like there's a few banks that are doing four point four four, but I don't like saying that because if there's just one and then you know, you've stress tested right up to the max based on a 4.44, you've got no room and you want to, you don't want to put yourself in a corner where, you know, you've been, this is everything's been planning based on a 4.44 and then it's, it's no longer available. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, last, absolute last question. Havan kind of okay. uh, doubled up here. What sure. uh, mortgage loan amount for personal residents will be approved for a household income around a hundred thousand K right now? Ooh, this is a, yeah, this is a good question. So mortgage loan amount for personal residents will be approved for, so again, this goes back to if you are, um, if you are doing this on a purchase, on a purchase, the maximum, and it's an insured mortgage, the maximum is 25 year amortization. We can't go above that. You're going to have a lower interest rate, but you're going to have a uh, lower amortization. And this is really key because if you go to 30 year amortization, you're stretching out your payments, which means you can actually afford a little bit more. Um, I would say about four times, not assuming or assuming you have very little debt uh, involved with it. So maybe 400, 450,000 would be your mortgage amount, right? And I don't know what your down payment is, but obviously add that down payment on top of it. For sure. That's your purchase price. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Dan, thank you. Lewis. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this is fun. It, it's it's been great. Hopefully, we can have you back again in the future. Yeah. Um, I'm going to close the call off with a couple of sides. So, Dan, you're more than welcome to stay stay aboard, or if you have to uh, split for another engagement, please no, feel free. But thank you so much for your uh, participation and all your very valuable information tonight. No, you're welcome. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you. All right. So, what do we have here? Wow, three seconds to spare. Talk about. Great timing. Um, so I hope everyone has found that very helpful. 
in your search for mortgages on your investment properties. We're going to wind down the call tonight with a couple of slides here if I can get them rolling. So please check out our website realestatewealthlab.com if there's any type of coaching or mentorship you need in the real estate space we have a whole slew of opportunities that you can definitely get yourself involved in and our step-by-step -step playbooks you definitely want to find out more about this again you can go to the website find some information and contact us if you like to follow up with any of these different playbooks and step-by-step -step guides we also have a copious amount of different tools and calculators there to help you really navigate and analyze your deals. All right, and we do have a 14 day trial. So if you wanna have your iPhone with you, click on that QR code. It'll lead you to a page that you can start to fill out your application and move forward with that promotion that we do have ongoing. And last but not least, make sure you check out the website for our upcoming events. They are most likely held on Wednesday nights at 7.30. We have calls twice a month, so you can check the calendar out there. Again, any questions, please get in touch with us at info at realestatewealthlab.com. And I am going to check our chat one last time. Thank you, Annalisa, for posting that information. And that is it. No more questions. Thank you, folks. Appreciate your attendance tonight. And if you, again, have any questions or want to uh, get in touch with us, please refer to the website and we'd be more than happy to contact uh, and connect you with Dan as well. So, Dan, thank you very much. I know you're muted there, but much appreciated. We'll definitely have you on again from everyone at the Real Estate Wealth Lab. Thank you for your attendance tonight and we'll, we'll see you very soon. Take care and good night.